redemption will be received in the heart of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so, I begin tonight's message by reminding each and every one of us here of something very important where we started off last night. God said to the people, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. And this sanctuary I indicated to you was at the center of the Hebrew or Israelite camp. So if you look on the screen, there's a little picture there on the screen that you will see soon. On that picture, there is this dwelling place, that place, that shakan. That Jesus wanted to dwell with his people. It was at the center of the Israelites camp. And surrounding that temple or sanctuary. That dwelling place that God wanted to be. Was the living quarters of the individuals. Just like how you are sitting almost around me right here. And I'm at the center. At the center was the tabernacle. That God asked to be designed. And so I said to you last night that just like how God dwells among the people at the center, it's the same way he wants to dwell in your heart. He wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the apple of your eye. He wants to be center in your life. Did you understand that from last night? Just like how the tabernacle is at the center, God wants to be the center of your life. And so this ancient tabernacle was the central piece. And so tonight, we want to go into this tabernacle because God said to Moses, you are going to make it just like the pattern that I showed you. Moses went up on the mountain. God showed Moses a blueprint, a sample of what he should make. In fact, I think Moses saw the real deal and he was to make from the real deal something here that reflects and symbolizes great truths and things to come. So Moses came down and he did just that. But within this sanctuary of God, there are specific furnitures. Let me ask you. God is going to ask for a dwelling place, somewhere that he can dwell amongst his people. Oh, you would think you would want to have a washing machine. Talk to me. Oh, you would think you would want to have one of those frigid air, deep freeze, double door refrigerator, cool, cool drink, six burner stove. Huh? Not to mention, Possibly, since he rested on the Sabbath day, he may just need a universe-sized bed. I mean, king size can't hold him, eh? He may just need a universe-sized bed. But you don't find any of those things in Scripture. The instruction that God gave, none of these items are listed there like that. And so we're going to journey through the Bible tonight. If you don't like to read Bible, I'm telling you tonight, you're going to read a lot of Bible. We are going to open the Bible. We are going to open the scripture. And we are going to look at these things in the sanctuary. And I'm going to take the furnitures, the items that are there one by one. We're laying a foundation tonight. Don't forget tonight's sermon. It's going to be important for you on Friday night. So here goes. What is the first item? Before I tell you the first item, let me describe to you what this sanctuary structure looked like. So remember, the sanctuary is at the center. The people are living around it. But also, there's a part of the sanctuary that we call the courtyard. So you have the courtyard. Then when you get to the sanctuary proper itself, you have a place that is called the most, that is called the holy place. And then from the holy place, there is a veil or a curtain that separates that section to another section that is called the most holy place. Now, it's important that you get that. So I'm going to say that one more time. 
just like what you're seeing on the screen. The people are living around. Then there's a courtyard. Right where you see that fire in the middle there, the courtyard. But then where you see that structure down there, that roof-like structure, that's the sanctuary proper. That has two compartments. It has a holy place and it has a most holy place. So if you were to just imagine with me, you down there would be the courtyard. And then this stage here, let's go again. You down there would be the courtyard. Then there will be an entrance to the building proper, the sanctuary proper right here. Almost like a veil coming in right here into the holy place. And when you're in the holy place, there is another veil almost down here. And beyond that is the most holy place. So inside that place that is called the most holy place has a furniture. In thy this place that is called the holy place has furniture. And then when you get down into the courtyard out there where you are, you still have furniture. And the people are living out there where you can call it the cars are. Can you imagine that? Are you imagining that? So now, let us work in this direction. I'm going to start from the what's over here. I want everybody online to say it with me and everybody here. I am going to start from this side, way over here, beyond the veil, which is the, the most holy place. The most holy place. God is using this. He's taking gospel, good news from the Old Testament. And he's using these symbols to Teach us redemption story. He has taken heavenly things and he has simplified it. He has dumbed it down to our level so that baby can understand the plan of redemption. This became important because man sinned. God said, thou shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And man disobeyed. And so death, because of one man sin, death entered the picture and the world. But God so loved these people that he came searching for you, searching for me, searching for mankind. He has placed a plan to save each and every one of you. Those watching online, those under the tent here, even if it's the first time you are coming here, God has a plan to save you. And he has placed the story and the symbols of all that he will do in this sanctuary story. And the sanctuary. He simplified it back then. And even in 2024. It is still relevant. Even in the end. As we move to the end of this world. It becomes even more relevant. Are you still with me? But I'm saying to you. He simplified it. He's telling redemption story. Using symbols. It's all pointing to how he's going to save you and I. Remember I said to you, there's a sin problem. If you have garbage in your house, what do you do? Do you store it under the bed? If you have garbage in your house, what do you do? Do you keep it in the refrigerator by the Livingston? Where do you empty your trash? Do you empty your trash in your toilet? Do you empty your trash in your kitchen? You take your trash to a place that keeps trash. That deals with trash. That incinerates trash. There is a place to deal with that. And I'm saying there is a sin problem in this world. That is the trash. God has a system to deal with that sin problem. To get rid of it. To take it out. Because sin separates you from God. How will he therefore deal with this sin thing? So that... You are no longer separated from him, but he can have communion with you face to face. How can a holy God dwells amongst an unholy set of people? He's using the sanctuary to teach us and to show us how he's going to empty the garbage bin 
of sin once and for all so that you and I can have eternal life. That's what he's doing. And so, let's go through tonight the furnitures. And I want to start with the first one. In Exodus 25, 10 to 11, let's see the instruction that God gave. I'm going to put it on the screen that you can see the furniture. But Exodus 25, 10 to 11, I want you to find that in your Bibles tonight. Exodus 25, 10 to 11. And they shall make me an ark. Did you hear that? This is the first furniture. This is the one that is located in the... Come on now. In the most holy place. And they shall make me an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubics shall be its length. And a cubic and a half its width. And a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. When I read this part, I said to myself, mm -mm -mm. If men are digging up graves for less than this, can you imagine if this pure gold of half cubics in length, cubic and a half in width was around? Talk about cash for gold. Overlay it with pure gold inside and out you shall overlay it and shall make it of a molding of gold all around. The key thing, this furniture of pure gold is the ark. The ark, an ark of acacia wood. This is the first piece of furniture that you find in this sanctuary if you're moving from the most holy down. But you see, it has two parts to it. The primary and original purpose, and I want everybody in this community and those online to hear the preacher right now, the primary and original function of this ark was to contain and to hold the law of God. The Ten Commandments written on two tablets of stone on both sides. That is important. Because not only is this ark representative of one. We shall complete it with other component. Representative of the throne of God. But the very throne of God. Is built up on his law which form his foundation. Now hear me now. The Bible lets us know. In Exodus 32 or Exodus 31 and verse 18. Let's look at that. Exodus 31 and verse 18. And then I'm going to look at Exodus 32 and verse 15. In Exodus 31 and verse 18. This is what the Bible says. And when he had made an end of speaking with him, that is God. I hear the Bible leaves spinning. I just have to pause to give you time to catch up. Since it's not on the screen here now, which it can be if you need it there. You just use the easy worship and put it up here live. But look in your Bible. I want you to see it for yourself. The Bible says, And when he, God, made an end of speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he, he who, on this side, he who, those online in the chat, put it there, he who, let's go again, he who, God gave Moses Two tablets of the testimony. Tablets of stone. Written with the finger of God. No RSVP fine point pen ball point pen. The finger. 
anger of God. So, did Moses write the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone? Who wrote it? God himself, the very finger of God. I'm working with the Bible. And then in Exodus 32 and verse 15, the Bible says, Exodus 32, just turn one leaf over, and verse 15. And Moses, by this time, having received the two tablets of stone, tablets of testimony, written by the finger of God on both sides, and Moses turned and went down from the where? The mountain. And the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Moses came down and these tablets went into the ark. Of the covenant. You have to listen to the preacher. It's there in Deuteronomy. It's there in Exodus. Did I say Moses put it on the outside? Moses put it on the inside of the ark. Of the covenant. Because on the outside of the ark of the covenant. There was the law of ordinances. Moses wrote those on parchment. Placed them on the outside. Because those were to be a witness against the people. Who said all that the Lord said, we will do. The very commandments and command of God. All I want those online and here to say to me tonight. What was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God, law of his testimony, ten commandments. Written on two tablets of stone. Not written on tissue paper. Not written on bounty wipe. Written on stone. And you know when they say something is written in stone, it's what? Permanent. If God's law could change and could be wiped away, why when man sinned, it did it a snap a finger and erased it? Why did Jesus have to leave heaven, come to earth and die for something that could be nailed to the cross or something that could be easily discarded? It is the foundation of his government. And so, it's inside the ark. I want somebody to understand tonight God's law is his foundation. It's inside the ark. And we have often asked the question, do you accept the law of God as foundation? Are you willing to abide by his commands when he commands things? Whatever his command is, love your neighbor as yourself, that is still a command from God. Love is the foundation of his government. Don't just look at it as Sabbath and thou shalt not kill. And it is love. It is the law of love. It is how you love the Lord thy God with all your heart. And how you love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hung the entire law. Ten is just to break it out in more details. Let you understand the vertical love and the horizontal love. But there's another part to the art. Still at the ark. What you see on the screen, and for those who are online, you'll see the screen. I just spoke about the lower part, the ark. But then there are two cherubims, angels, that are on top with wings overstretched, covering their face and looking down. What are they looking down on? At the top of the ark, there's a thing or a place, a covering. That is called the mercy seat. Remember? On top of the law, there is the what? The mercy seat. In fact, in Exodus 25 and 22, the Bible lets us know in Exodus 25 and verse 32, and there, speaking about the mercy seat, I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. 
from between the two cherubims which are on the ark of the testimony. God is speaking with Moses and the people from the mercy seat. You have to understand that. This mercy seat here, it symbolizes God's throne. God's throne, the mercy seat, is sitting on the ark. And between the two cherubims is the presence of God. God dwells between the two cherubims. In fact, our high priest, who is Jesus Christ, he intercedes for us at the mercy seat. Many of us, we need mercy. All of us need mercy, as a matter of fact. But Jesus intercedes for us and say, mercy applied to this one. My blood, dear father. He's a sinner. She's a sinner. But he or she needs mercy. Because the law, which the mercy seat covers, because of the law and what it dictates, you should have been dead. But Jesus says mercy, mercy, mercy. In fact, not only does Jesus fulfill this mercy seat, in Romans 3, 21 to 26, the emphasis is on verse 25. But I'm going to give you it from 21. I did say we're doing a lot of reading. Mark these texts down. Romans 3, 21 to 26. This is important information that you must have and you must know as we talk through this topic. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For how many have sinned? Verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his what? It is by the grace of God that you are justified. Through the redemption that is in whom? Christ Jesus. So if you watch any movie... Or you hear anybody say to you that Jesus Christ is a way into heaven. Lie. I'm going to say that one more time. If anyone says to you that Jesus Christ is a way into heaven. Lie. Jesus is the way into heaven. There is none other. No other name under heaven by which men can be saved. No Selassie, no Mohammed, no Buddha, no Confucius, no prime minister, no king, no queen. The Bible say his grace through the redemption that is in none other but Jesus Christ. Here is verse 25. Whom God set as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed it is because of Jesus Christ and what he represents and what he has done and what he did at Calvary why even the sins committed in the past, God could pass over them and say forgiven. Jesus Christ. That is what the Bible is saying right here. Because of his perfect life, his death in our place, Jesus is the mediator. He stands between us and God and he pleads to God on our behalf. And that's why Jesus is a sacrifice of atonement. But I want you to answer me this question tonight. Those who are hearing so far and you're following me. Do you accept Jesus' plea for mercy for you? If you're sitting here 
And you know that you are only here and alive because there's a God watching over you. Let me see you raise your hand. I see those hands. So tonight, do you accept Jesus' plea for your life? I see those hands. It's very important. Those online, you can put those hands in the chat and I look for them also that you understand that. So the first thing, the Ark of the Covenant, God's Ten Commandments, mercy's throne on top, mercy seat right there. Jesus is our mediator. He intercedes on our behalf. And so we're going to move to the next furniture. The next furniture that I'm going to go to is one found in Exodus 30 and verse 1. God gives instruction in Exodus 30 and verse 1. And the Bible says, You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. What's the next furniture? The altar of incense. And so, this is where my camera person is now. You're going to work your gymnastics. Right over here. So remember, you have over in that compartment over there, the Ark of the Covenant. On top is the mercy seat. The mercy seat is sitting on and covering the what? The law which is inside the Ark. When you step through the curtain, the veil that is right here that you cannot see into the most holy place, you have to step through to come out and right at the veil here the priest would stand up with the veil but there is a furniture and it's right here i know you're going to want to see i'm going to ask somebody to just come elder come and help me to carry it down here remember this furniture would be right here in front of the most holy place but i'm going to bring it right down here so that you can see It takes two strong men to carry this. Oh, thank you, Helder. I felt those muscles moving. So the altar of incense. This piece of furniture would be right in front of the veil. Now, what is it for? Let's go to the Bible. Look at Exodus 30, 8. 7 to 8. Let's start right there. Exodus 30, 7 to 8. When you're there, let me know if it's on the screen. Exodus 30, 7 to 8. And I'll just read a part of it for you. It says, And Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense. Every when. Come on now. And Aaron the priest shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamp, he shall burn incense on it. These sweet incense here, I wonder what all of this is saying. Let the Bible speak for itself. When you get to Romans 8 and verse 34, find that and hold that. This sweet incense, the priest will come. And whenever the priest is going to offer prayer for the people, he will burn sweet incense and pray for the sins of the people. I'm saying all of this is teaching us and pointing to the story of redemption and what Jesus will do. It is all pointing to Jesus and his work to save you and I tonight. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 8 and verse 34, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes inter what? Session for us. Purr is prayed over the altar of burnt incense. Sweet fragrance with the purr of the priest ascends. As Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary, he would intercede on our behalf. Sweet incense, your purrs like sweet incense ascend to God. Don't take prayer lightly. There's somebody here. 
You're praying for a breakthrough in your life. I am saying a whole heavenly setup is designed to accept your prayers so that God can hear them and he moves to the prayers of his praying people. But the Bible is not done. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. You will have to catch up with me because I have a few more to go through. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he is always, or since he always lived to make what? Intercession for them. God is always making, Jesus is always making intercession for you. And that is why in Revelation 8 and verse 3, the Bible says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. This very altar. When I say this very one, I mean in symbolism. He was given much incense. But here it is now, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which is before God the incense is rising like prayers symbolizes Christ's intercession for you and I brethren that's why when you pray you must pray without ceasing and you must pray in confidence because Jesus is the one hearing your prayers and he's offering your prayers up to God as sweet incense to God his sacrifice, his blood, his mixed offering, a sweet perfume, the petition of God's people. Our prayers are mingled with incense and they reach the Father's ear. And God and Jesus talks to the Father for you. Do you know the song? And I will talk to my Father for you. Have you ever looked at a child? There's mommy, there's daddy, and sometimes the child wants something. And the child goes to one of the parents, sometimes it's mommy, to plead with mommy and to talk with mommy so that mommy can go talk to daddy. And sometimes it's the other way around. The child talks to daddy so that daddy can go and talk to mommy. It's almost like one is playing the role of an intercessor. Quite similar. Not really the same. But I'm just using that. Jesus, hears your prayers. Sometimes you pray and you're hurt so badly you don't even know the words to form. You don't even know the things to say. Sometimes the words can't even form on your lips. Sometimes you say a prayer, but in your heart, there's most of the prayer that is still there. But I'm saying to you that at the altar of incense, Jesus understands your pain. He knows what you are going through. And he's taking your prayer and he's presenting it before the Father. And the text in the New Testament lets us know that the Holy Spirit is involved in the entire process of things. There's a whole heavenly orchestration working for the people of God tonight are you understanding what I'm saying to you tonight you are not alone the devil lets you feel down and disappointed because he knows the heavenly reinforcement that is on your side so he wants you to give up but tonight you are not giving up because you have an intercessor in heaven, who is Jesus Christ, who takes your prayers and takes your tears and takes your hurt and takes everything and he presents it to the Father and pleads his blood for you. How can you live a life in rejection to all this goodness that is happening here? Let me ask you this question, those online, those here tonight. Do you accept God's, and let me put it this way, do you accept Jesus' personal intercession for you? If that is you, raise your hand. And I see those hands going up. Those in the chat, I'm asking you the question too. Do you accept Jesus' personal intercession for you tonight? If that is the case, put your response in the chat. 
I'm watching the time. I must cover them all. Which furniture is this? Don't forget it. Put it in the chat. Which furniture is this? Altar of burn incense. Much intercession is taking place here for you. Let's look at Exodus 25, verse 23. Catch me if you can. The Bible says, Exodus 25 and verse 23, and I'll read 23, and I'll read verse 30. You shall also make a table. A what? A what? A table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. You, verse 30 now, you shall set showbread on the table before me always. What is cocoa bread doing in the temple? It's not cocoa bread. I just said that to catch your attention. But what is bread doing in the temple? Is it a bakery? What is bread doing here in the temple? Well, let me pull this table back a little bit. I'm just using this to represent the table of showbread. In fact, I deliberately place it right here because this very podium that I'm preaching from is a part of it. So, you have the altar of incense. We are in the which part of the temple now? The holy. And in the holy place, the altar of incense right before the veil. And then you have two other furnitures. You have the table of showbread. As the Bible says in Exodus 25, 23. And I read verse 30. But if you read all the way to 30, you'll realize that 12 loaves... Stacks of loaves there are on it, representing the 12 tribes adorned on the table. But this bread is consecrated bread. This is not just any bread. This is bread in the holy place. It is representative that God, that God is sustainer. But above all, that Jesus Christ is the living bread of life. He came down from heaven to grant us eternal life. The Bible lets us know in John 6 and verse 35. And Jesus said, and I'm going to run now so the foot soldiers will have to catch up with me with the fingers. And Jesus said, through the Bible, John 6 and verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. The bread is representing again Jesus Christ. Altar of incense, Jesus and his intercession. Ark of the covenant in the most holy place at the mercy seat. Jesus, our propitiation and mediator. The table of showbread, Jesus, the bread of life. But in John 6, 51 to 58, he continues. I am the living bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will forever, he will live forever, that is. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I'm still there in the Bible. I'm at verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? But they're missing it. Jesus is teaching them big lesson. Because this is big teacher teaching them big things in simple ways. But they have PhDs and they can't see it. You have to go to school to have PhD to understand these things. Simple, simple things that God put for us to understand. We can't take up the Bible and understand it. You need to go and study big things to understand it. Nothing like that. Jesus is making it simple right here. So he continued to say, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This applies to you too here today, no? If you are living a life outside of Christ, you are a walking dead. 
And if you refuse to accept the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and you refuse until the day that you die, might as well while you are alive, you are just laying down in the cemetery but beside those graves. You are a walking dead if you refuse to accept Jesus Christ. There is no other way on the heaven by which men can be. Then Jesus said to them, he continues, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. When? So though he may die in this life, Jesus says, if you accept me as the living bread and you walk in my light and my way, though you may die in this life, I will raise you up. In the last day. I never said that. Jesus said that. For my flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. He who eats of my flesh. And drinks of my blood. Abides in me. And I in him. As the living father sent me. I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me. Will live because of me. So if all you feed on. Is bulla and it is not Jesus. You will not live. If all you feed on. Is Kentucky fried chicken. And not Jesus. You will not live. You have to be feeding. On the sweet sweet word. Of God. To sustain yourself. Because the food of this world can't nourish you like how oh, this bread will nourish you. This bread is not from National Bakery. This bread is not from Duncan's Bakery. This bread is not from Coronation Market. This bread here come from Heaven's Bakery. And this bread is what you need to sustain you. But we don't open the bread. We eat all 18 slices of this natural brown sliced bread. And we match up the hard dough bread. But when it comes to this bread, cobweb. But this is the bread that will sustain you. Dust off the cobweb tonight, I'm telling you. No junjo no grow and this a bread here. This bread is bread that is divine. I think I'm speaking alone right here. Jesus is the bread of life. And so just as the priests partook of the show bread, we feast on Christ's word. The sustenance that satisfies the soul. I tell you, no matter how you crack open the bottle, a boom, rum, Red Bull, you only feel good for a little while and that is not even the real deal feel good. Even though you satisfy yourself with the things of this world, whether the liquor, the Hennessy, the top level drink them upon the shelf, the syrup, the special, none of those will satisfy the soul because even with that tomorrow morning you have hangover, Tomorrow morning, you're still at square one. You're still unhappy. What satisfies the soul is the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. If you, over here, I'm watching you, those online right here, if you, yes, I'm speaking to you, you and you over here, do you accept Jesus as your bread of life tonight? I'm happy for those who said yes. Exodus 25, 31 to 39. Jesus still teaching us redemption using simple, simple things. He's showing us how he's going about redemption. Exodus 25, 31 to 39. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. Everything is gold. Between brands and gold, man. Expensive furniture, these, you know. This are not chichi food. You hear me? 
expensive things them run. Pure gold, no water dung thing. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be hammered, shall be of hammered work. Its sharp shafts, its branches, its balls, its ornaments, its knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its side, three branches of the lampstand out of one side, and three of the lampstand out of the other side. Let's see if we got it right. Mm -mm. Are you seeing it? Three on one side, three from the other side. Count with me. Uno, dos, cuatro, cinco, seis. You're all Spaniards in here. That's good. How many did you get? Seven. Seven branch candlesticks. Exodus 27 and verse 20. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring your pure oil of pressed olive for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. The lamp should be burning continually. These seven lamps illuminated. This was the light in the holy place. It gave light to the holy place. In fact, the Bible lets us know. Let me ask you. If the altar of incense is pointing to your stomach. Let's go again. If the altar of incense is pointing to Jesus. The table of showbread pointing to then the seven branch candlestick with the light which is the light of the holy place is pointing to Come on now. I did say, give me the light. Didn't I say that? Yeah. Give me the light. Yeah. I'm saying it's pointing to Jesus. Let's start at John chapter 1, 6 to 12. There was a man, John 1, 6 to 12. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light with capital L at it. That all through him might believe he was not the light. John wasn't the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming to this world. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Who could that be? Not John. This must be Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own his own did not receive him, but many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called children of God. To those who believe in him, Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. Give me the light. Must be Jesus. And so in John 8 and verse 12, Jesus said and spoke to them saying, I am, come on now, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Give me Jesus. Jesus. His light, I am saying to you, dispels darkness and guides us towards salvation. But many of us prefer darkness. Darkness than light. What kind of world are we living in when man rather darkness than light? I am saying to each and every one of you, walk in the light. And walk in the light whilst you have the light. One day soon probation will close. And you will no longer have that opportunity. But whilst the light is shining, what do I say to you? Walk in the light. Now tell me, elder, how? Well, let me not start there. Jesus is dispelling darkness with his light towards truth and salvation. Then how can we say the Old Testament is done away with? And it's the very Old Testament that I'm reading from. 
that the very New Testament is even shedding light on, then if you discard the Old Testament and say, done away with, you are discarding light. And anybody that discards light can't be true or not walking in the truth. You have to be careful. Don't let them fool you. This is the word of God. There is Jesus read from the Old Testament, quoted from the Old Testament, and then in 2024, it's done away with. That is not truth. That is error. And I'm saying respectfully, walk out of error into truth. It is profane to teach that the Old Testament is done away with when that is the very foundation which God used to teach this very gospel I'm preaching from tonight. But I must touch two other and then we close. Exodus 30, 18 to 19. Exodus chapter 30. I need to hear those Bible leaves spinning. Exodus 30, 18 to 19. You shall also make a laver of bronze with his base also of bronze and if you're following me what must it use, be used for you're not there as yet those online tell me you shall also make a lave of bronze with his base also of bronze for to wash come on now you know it's the word lave that is fooling you you call it basin. Basin. It's just that you go to the Chinese store and it's blue basin, you see, and red basin. But this is bronze basin. Bronze labor. You ain't going to find this in no haberdashery and no supermarket around this place. Mm -mm. We're talking about heaven's furniture. Come on now. You still with me? Okay, good. It says... You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. So by this time now, we are on the outside, in the outer court. So let me just let you catch up with me. Over in the compartment over there, Ark of the Covenant. Inside, that is the most holy. Inside the holy, you have the table of shewbread. Well, you have the altar of incense first. You have the table of shewbread on one side. Seven branch candlestick on the other side. Light of the world, bird of life, intercessor. Then you step out of this compartment, and just as you go down where you are, Nana, you're following me? There is the lever. And I'm going to have a seat right here. Watch me now. Lever. Really and truly, for the purpose of this community and evangelistic impact, all of this is labor for you. But I'm getting there. For now, labor. Look at the text. To wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put what in it? Not double A T A. What you what, what should you put in it? Water. Say water. I wonder why they're going to put water in the basin. Which bright person wants to tell this pastor why water is going to go into a bronze basin? To wash. Who said that? Hands and feet. To wash your hands and to wash your feet. To wash. To wash. Of course to wash. Before the priest steps into the holy place to go into the presence of God, you must wash. Come on now. You must wash. In fact, let me give you the text right here. Or some more text with that. Or let's finish that one right there. I'm going to give you a text in Ephesians 5 and verse 26. Just hold it right there. We're not there as yet. Let me take my phone and follow those who are still watching us online. The priest would wash in this daily. Each time going in, wash hands, wash feet. 
it represents and it symbolizes a cleansing. A cleansing that should take place. A cleansing that God is even using to teach each and every one of us. That when we come into his presence, we must be cleansed. But hear me now. You have to understand this. Yes, I am saying, it's not, this is not what I'm saying, but I'm saying it, but not what I'm saying. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I know someone will leave and say, Pastor is saying you must bathe before you come to church. That's not what I'm saying. But yes, I'm saying that too. But that's not what I'm saying. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Nothing wrong to use water for that purpose. That's good hygiene. That's okay. But this is spiritual lessons we're talking about. So what other washing? Come on now, talk to me. I hear you say wash away your sins. Now how do you wash in this instance? Must I fall over into it? Then talk to me. Repentance, that is correct. But wash and dip in the water of baptism. You see, it's going to come important to you. You must come Friday night. You cannot miss Friday night. I'm just laying the foundation. But the labor is symbolizing the washing that takes place. When you and I choose to accept Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, we go through baptism. It's symbolizing a cleansing, a change of life symbolism that we are following Jesus Christ. We have chosen to make him our Lord and Savior. So when you say, Pastor, I want to be what baptized, you are washing away old ways. You are washing away dirty habits. You are washing away dirty behavior because you are accepting coming in the presence of God. Is that anything too hard? To accept Jesus Christ? Through baptism, the labor. You can accept him in your heart. The key thing is that you are sincere and you confess your sins and you repent. And you choose to turn away. The baptism therefore becomes a symbol that you are willing to do that. Ephesians 5 and verse 26 says, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Say, so see the word of God comes back? Even the word is called the water of, or the water by the word is called right there. It's representative of repentance. Just like how the priest would wash daily, we need constant renewal. Repentance is not just a one-time thing, Elder Grant. I'm a little over time, but I'm going to wrap it up right now. But this is important. You're resting tomorrow night. Come on. If this were a rebel salute, the people would just be walking in. To stand up all night till the morning, till police come lock it off at 7 o'clock. I am giving you bread of life information. I am giving you divine dynamite. Sorry, we are Jamaicans. Divine dandemite information. So with that said, I'll be out in less than seven minutes. So, the liver, the basin, is whispering to you, whispers of redemption, you know, it's whispering to you, come and be washed anew. Do you want to be washed in the blood of the Lamb tonight? If that is you, raise your hand. I've seen those hands. Look how many times you have agreed to what I've said. You want to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let Lord Jesus wash you tonight. But let's go to one last thing, or one last two things. Exodus 20 and verse 24. Exodus 20 and verse 24, if you're there, say amen. The Bible says, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it burnt offering, your peace offering, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. This text is setting up what is sacrificed on the next furniture, the altar. 
the bronze altar. Now go to Exodus 27 and verse 1. We're there now. Exodus 27 and verse 1. If you're there, say amen. Exodus 27 and verse 1 says, You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square and its height shall be how many cubits? Three cubits. Lever is at the entrance. And for those online, don't worry about the aesthetics of the tent right now. It's tent. It's not building. Altar. Burnt altar sacrifice. Right here. What do you think goes on this? Chocho? Yaman Coco? What do you think goes on the altar of sacrifice? So remember, you have the altar of sacrifice, then the laver. Then you get into the holy, table of showbread, seven branch candlestick, altar of incense, and then into the most holy, the Ark of the Covenant. But we're out here now, the altar of sacrifice. I took a journey, you know, but we're right here, altar of sacrifice. In fact, the Bible lets us know, in the practice then, a sacrificial lamb would be brought. Because there's no forgiveness of sin unless there's a shedding of blood. The individuals will confess their sins on the lamb. Remember, this is God just teaching us in symbols. The gospel, the good news. The bad news is that you should have been dead. But he's teaching you the good news just in symbol. It's just symbols. He's using to teach you what he is doing to save you. The lamb can't save you. The blood of lamb can't save you. It is pointing to a greater reality that if Jesus is the light, if the table of showbread is Jesus, the altar of incense is Jesus, then what goes on the altar of sacrifice is who? I have a good elder. Pastor Slim, don't go too far. The goat will run with me. No, he's not going to tie the goat on me. We'd have a drama here tonight if Elder tied the goat around my waist. <laughs> now hear me now. Altar of sacrifice. In fact, I want to read this for you and then I go right here. John 1 and verse 29. The next day, John 1 and verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He is. So, Elder. All right. We finish with the sanctuary thing. I don't want nobody to say that pastor take goat in the holy place. All right? I'm going up here for a reason. So we finish with that. Elder, get me a chair, please. Brethren, look on the poor innocent animal. When you commit a sin, not the animal. When you commit a sin, you take a lamb without blemish, without spots, and deformity. You lay your hand and you confess your sin. And you, not the priest, take a knife, come goatee,
Do you like this animal? What's, what's her name, Elder? Goat. I think that is the I think that is the family name. What is her name? Give give me a name you want to give her. How dare you say curry goat? Oh, I I was told. I think the, the Betty. That's the owner. Thank you, right there. This is Betty Goat. I want the camera to zoom in on Betty Goat's face. Look on Betty Goat. Betty Goat. Talk to pastor. Can you imagine you raising Betty Goat and you raising Betty Goat and you need a lamb for sacrificial purposes and you're going to come to Betty Goat take Betty Goat to the temple lay your hands on Betty Goat this innocent animal never did nothing wrong you did the wrong Confess your sins on Betty Goat and take a knife and slit Betty Goat's throat. Because the blood is what will be traveling through the sanctuary. Betty Goat. Imagine if you and I were to be doing this today. No, Betty Goat. I don't wrong. If the government tax you. The goat tax you. If I'm going to go as a showpiece, then I must get a leaf. <laughs> Come, my elder. Lest nothing is left on the stage and Betty Goat eats everything. Just stay right here. The innocent lamb, you have transferred your guilt and your sins to it. And sacrifice on the altar. Your life of sacrifice on the altar laid. The priest would take the blood, wash hands and feet, enter into the holy place, go all the way down to the altar of incense, sprinkle blood inside there, and with prayer confess the sins of the people daily. And one time for the year, only one, he will go into the most holy place to cleanse it. But friends, as John tells us in John 1 and verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I'm saying to somebody here tonight, it's all about Jesus it has always been about Jesus. And all God is doing is showing us in symbols how he's going to heal this world. Take care of the sin problem so that you and I can have eternal life. Jesus the innocent. He died so that you and I could be set free. You could have life and have that life abundantly. Why are we wasting this opportunity of life away? 30 years, 40 years, 60 years, 70 years. A life without Jesus is wasted years. The lamb has already been slain once and for all. You don't need. No more lamb. Jesus is the lamb. The question is, and I'm done. Will you accept his sacrifice today? Will you accept his sacrifice today? And if that is you, and you're willing to accept the sacrifice of God today, to cover your life, to grant you victory in life. Stand with me. I'm going to pray tonight. And we're closing. I'm just asking. 
It's all about Jesus. Everything that we did tonight is all about Him. Heaven's furniture, whispers of redemption. God is using symbols to teach us how He's saving you and how He's saving me. Because we're out of time, is there one person? Haven't seen the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you? You have not yet surrendered to Him, but you want to step in the victory zone tonight. Step in the victory zone tonight. You're all on the altar of sacrifice laid. You are stepping right here in the victory zone tonight. You are here and you want to be covered under the sacrifice, the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel. You have not yet accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Come forward. If you're feeling inside of you that anxiety, that nervousness, that you can't walk in all this light to come into the victory zone. Don't watch any face. Don't watch nobody. Come into the victory zone tonight. Thank you. Thank you. One more. There must be one more person here tonight that wants to step in the victory zone. One more person. One more person here tonight. Thank you, my sister. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus wants to take away your sins. He wants to put beside your name the blood of Jesus. Come. Come. I see those who are coming. Tonight we are rebuking the devil. Tonight we are accepting in the sacrifice of God and if that is you and you want to accept that victory come come God be praised God be praised God be praised behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world I'm happy for those who step in the victory zone tonight that innocent lamb has already been slain tonight you gain the victory for those who are standing here Jesus loves you he has gone all the way for you the worst that can happen in your life has already been taken out of the equation Jesus went to Calvary and died the death that you deserve that you could have the life that was his the worst has already been removed just accept There one more Pastor Monroe I will have to ask you to do the opportunity of praying tonight one more as the pastor comes if you're in the darkness of the periphery come forward as those at the altar you can just bow your head talk to Jesus let him know your problems. Let him know your struggles. We each have our own difficulties in life. But tonight, there is a difference. Let him into your life tonight. You have tried it your way too many times. 30 years, you have been doing it your way. Tonight is the time to give Jesus a chance. Let him work for you. Let him open doors of opportunity for you. Let him enter your life tonight. I won't be longer. One more person. Come. Pastor Monroe, I want to ask you to petition the throne of grace tonight. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. Great God and our Father, we're happy to know that in Jesus we have salvation. And tonight, the gospel has been presented to us. If we receive it, Lord, 
We will experience your grace. Our lives will be transformed. The joy of heaven will be in our hearts. So tonight, we thank you. We praise you for the preaching of the word. The Lord is over to us to receive this truth. So tonight, I pray that your people who have listened will respond positively to the gospel tonight. We're happy for those who have walked to the altar. Lord, they need this gospel because without it, life is wasted. They have no hope without Jesus. So tonight, as they would have walked to the altar, we pray that this will be the beginning of walking in the light of truth. The Lord, they will give themselves to you. They will surrender to you so that you can wash away their sins. You can give them strength and courage. You can sustain them. You can guide their feet in this dark world of sin. You can help them, Lord, to live a beautiful life as described in your law. So that when you come, Heavenly Father, they can all have eternal life. You have young ones who are here tonight who need Jesus to guide their young feet. You have those who once walked with you, who have served you in the past, and need to return to you in full surrender. Receive them tonight and bless them. Remove all the barriers, Lord, so that they can surrender to you. Bring that conviction. Make it so strong, almighty God, that they will have no rest until they surrender all to Jesus. We just pray that somebody tonight, a woman, a man, a young girl, a boy, will experience salvation. Bless your people. We ask, O oh God, Thank you again for your man servant. Put your angels by his side to protect him as he travels. Bless him with another word for tomorrow, for Friday night. We pray that you be with all of us who have worshipped here tonight. As we go to our various homes, we pray that you will take us home safely. Protect us from evil in all its form. And may your words abide with us. May this spot of ground be a place where people are delivered as they go through this series. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Monroe. And as you go, just remember that just for this week, Thursday night, tomorrow night, we are not here, but on Friday night, we are here. We will pick up back our regular routine as of Friday night, so we'll be here Friday night, Sabbath all day, Sunday night, Monday night of next week, Tuesday night of next week, Wednesday night of next week, and we rest on Thursday night of next week. We pick up back on Friday. That's six days for the week we are here, five nights and one day, the Sabbath day. As we go now, it's certainly a pleasure. Spread this gospel, share this link, because healing begins at the sanctuary. But God has a message for each and every one of you online. And it was a pleasure serving you. And preaching the good news of salvation. Walk good. Take care. And it's pure love.